Hi y'all, welcome to my shop. Today I want to talk about uh, box design. Uh, wood turning boxes is one of my most fun projects. It ranks right up there with Christmas tree ornaments. You know, I've turned a lot of bowls, but bowls are not as, as much of my main thing as some of the spindle turning. And, and boxes give you great opportunities for creative design. A lot of times when you're first starting off, most a lot of the boxes you see are basically cylinder boxes, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I'll show you pictures of several of mine. But I want to open up your ideas and creative processes to something a little bit different. Uh, where do we get design inspiration? Well, we get it from, in many instances, from the internet. Here's some of the pictures. I have a, a Pinterest board, Pinterest.com, a great place for you when you're doing research on a, on a project to, to just store uh, pictures. So I have one out there under Mike Peace Wood Turning. I've got several different uh, separate boards, but one of them is on box uh, turned boxes uh, with a lot of a lot of different designs so that's a great source of inspiration another source of inspiration are the various uh, books that are available uh, let me show you show you a few uh, one this one's out of print uh, by Chris Stott 50 turn boxes 50 designs and a number of the boxes that I'll show you today come from this book it doesn't go as much detail as on turning boxes but as showing these 50 boxes with scale models and, and talking about about them a little bit but it is a great book but my favorite box turning book is this one by Richard Raffin this is an older one he did a newer one a few years uh, uh, later after he did this one with colored pictures but the contents basically the same uh, it's out of print both of the older one and this one uh, and the one's a little newer but you can generally pick these up at a very reasonable uh, cost from a used online books, bookstore or even Amazon. And of course, my favorite overall just wood turning book in general is Richard Raffin's book, Taunton's Complete Illustrated Guide to, to, to Wood Turning by Richard Raffin. This is a tremendous book. This one's hardback. It also comes in a paperback, and I believe it, it may be out of, out of print, but you can generally get this used at a very reasonable price. And the reason I mention these is box turning is a very sequential uh, process and, and it, it helps if you know what that process is. And of course I've got some of that in, in those various other videos on making a, making a box, but I did want to just at least mention, mention that. So let's talk a little bit about, well let's ask that question, what is a box? I think most of y'all would, would answer the question, if I asked what is this object, you'd say it's a bowl. But it could be a box if it had a lid, because generally a box is considered uh, typically a, a, a lidded container. We are using this to collect money at a, at a meeting. You'd drop in a dollar if you came to the meeting. So. so that's what we're talking about is basically wood-turned lidded vessels. Now there's an old saying that form follows function. What that means is that, that whatever you make ought to accomplish what you intended to do with it. That is, if, if you want it to be a pillbox, and we'll talk we'll show pillboxes later, it needs to be able to hold pills and, and have a lid that will, will stay fairly secure, for, for example. Uh, I, I went to a... Uh, when I first started wood turning, I, I visited my sister over in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, she was president of her local craft council and they, uh, art council, and they were having a, a sale, a uh, craft show, art, art show actually they called it, in her neighborhood. It was in a model home, so it was going to be indoors. I didn't have to set up. Uh, it's only uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, uh, it was, uh, wine was available, so it was a very nice, pleasant event. But the night before, as we were getting ready for it, uh, my sister was going through some of my things and asking a few questions, and she picked up a bowl, and, and she'd say, what would you use this for? And I thought, well, I don't know. I just turned a bowl, because, you know, I was still into the basics of, of wood turning. And she said, asked me what kind of finish it had, and she says, is that a food safe finish? And I thought, well, I don't know. I never thought if I'd put a putting a, uh, putting food in it. And those questions were, were very helpful to me later on as I got to thinking a little bit more about when you do turn something, what are you turning it for and, and, and understand what you're turning it for and design it, design it for that. Let me just start off with showing a few pictures of, of two different styles of, of boxes and we're going to start first with, with functional boxes, boxes that we have some, have some specific 
uh, functional use for. Uh, this one is uh, one out of Brad Bradford Pear that's got a tiger wood top uh, with a uh, black wood uh, knob and some Zentangle uh, barography decoration on the side. This is designed as a kitchen can, uh, counter or a kitchen container for, for dried goods or maybe uh, cookies or you know flour or what have you. It's not, not very large. Uh, but that was the, in, the intent of it when I made it. And it's got a very loose fit lid. Uh, this is more artistic probably than functional, but this is a ring box. So the top of the box at Aladdin's lamp type spire, spire uh, you actually designed to put a, put a ring over it and keep, keep it in place. And you open it up and you've got a place to put it, maybe a couple of earrings. This is a threaded acorn box, and you say, well, how is that functional? Well, th these things are often used as keepsake uh, urns or, or keepsake containers to put some cre uh, cremains in. This is a, one you might identify with. It's a Beads of Courage box. It's got a little beads of, a bead of courage bead at the very top. And again, as a functional box, it's got to meet certain minimum requirements. They, they re request that they be at least six inches uh, larger in, in diameter in order they could hold all the many beads that some child going to the uh, a hospital treatment program with burns or cancer uh, that gets beads for treatment they, they've got to be able to have a place to store all those uh, threaded threaded beads so it needs to be a good size container and a loose fit it's a garlic box uh, this did not form did not follow function because I didn't understand how big garlics were. Uh, were. I made this for my son. It was a, a foodie. I saw the picture, and you can see it's got a little air hole, so that's that's functional. So it, you know the the garlic could, could get some airflow in there. But I didn't make it quite large enough. I just didn't realize how large garlics uh, could, garlic could be. Here's another kitchen container. Again, Brad from Pear with uh, uh, African blackwood top top. Here's uh, definitely some functional boxes, even though they're very artistic looking. I got this design from uh, Michael Stafford in North Carolina, who does a lot of boxes. And this is these are pill boxes, so they've got to be large enough to, to uh, hold pills. I gave a pill box similar to this, not quite this design, but made made in the same way as this, where you drill out the bottom, you drill out the top with a larger uh, drill bit. And I start off with too small a drill bit, and I gave it to a fellow in my men's group at, at church. And he brings it back later and says, Mike, my, my pills just won't fit in that, that box. So, I, again, form follows function, so I needed to upsize my drill bit for the bottom and the top to make it really useful for anybody, not just tiny little aspirin, baby aspirin. Uh, here's a functional box. This is a uh, jewelry box with a... With dividers in the middle that, that's been flocked uh, with kind of a velvet uh, surface to put put jewelry in and again an easy lift handle and then here's another jewelry box I made for my my wife's got three three tiers again a, a very functional box the other style of boxes are what you might call artistic boxes let me show some examples they can certainly be functional. This is a holly box. It's probably three, three and a half inches across. Uh, very nice. I, I like the decoration on it. I put a little effort into it. I am not a wood artist. I'm not all that creative, but, but there are some definitely techniques that you can learn uh, as a wood turner. I'm a very left brain person. If someone asks, that knows me, uh, if someone asks and says, is Mike more of an engineer or an artist? It's a definitely an, an engineer type. I'm not, I wasn't trained in an engineer, but I'm a very logical left brain thinker as opposed to right, right brain thinker. But you can learn an awful lot, and as I've learned a lot about, about art and, and design. Uh, here's an example of a, uh, an artistic box, a, a winged, winged box of walnut. Uh, doesn't serve any particular purpose other than to be decorative uh, as a, as a knickknack. Can a catenary curve. Uh, here's a box. I turned this one at uh, at Aramont School of Arts, Arts and Crafts up in, 
in uh, Gatlinburg, Tennessee with uh, Beth Ireland a, a few years ago. Beth's a very creative uh, person and toward the end of the, the class, it was, it, it, the class was primarily, I think, on turning boxes. Uh, she gave me the assignment of turning a box that looked like a padlock. This is fairly good size. This is probably, oh, eight, eight, eight inches across, maybe uh, more than three inches uh, thick. Here's one, a little sassafras scrap and uh, base and, and some coca bolo uh, uh, lid, certainly an art piece, not, not very deep box, not useful for much other than look at, but I think it achieves that, that purpose. Uh, this one is, a, I think you can generally recognize this as a, a rook style box. Uh, unfortunately when I was making it I got carried away with hollowing before I shaped the fully shaped the outside and the outside I would have preferred to come in a little bit more like a typical uh, a rook but it makes a very serviceable box with, with pretty good room inside. And here's one purely artistic. Uh, that sphere uh, comes off and, and opens up. And then this is this one came out of Christot's uh, 50, 50 book or 50, 50 box uh, book. Uh, it looks like maybe a perfume bottle but it, or a Roman canteen was is generally what people call this this style turned on a multi-axis with uh, a couple of pieces of contrasting wood and some texturing on it. And uh, here's a box. Uh, we will let, let me before before we go any further with this one just take a glance at that that box and then I'm going to sh shift I'm going to go over to one more box and then we're going to come back to this one and there's the last one a, a box of, of Bradford Bradford pear that uh, is a mushroom not a lot of room in it so let's talk a little bit about about designing a box well, I believe in when you're making a box it in a lot of other wood turning projects not necessarily all of them but a lot of them it pays to sketch out your thoughts uh, so then you know what size wood you're going to need and, and generally where you're going to go with it. Uh, for example, in this case I had a round a bead at the top. I deviated a little bit in the final one as you'll, you'll see. Uh, but I, I really thought about the three feet and the shape I wanted it to have, the inset lid uh, that where the rim of the box would be slightly proud of, of the limb. And I, I designed this thing and then I went off and uh, I went down basement one day, he's going to turn this box, but I didn't have the design with me. It was uh, upstairs and something was going on upstairs, and cl cleaning folks or something. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll just go from memory. And then that's the box I turned from memory. It doesn't look anything like the other one other than it had a spherical top and, and three feet. Uh, but it still was, I, I was heading in the right direction by having done the design. Now, when I... I I sold this box, somebody liked it, uh, so I went back and thought, okay, well I want to finish turning another one, a replacement box, uh, based on this design, and this is what I came up with. And you can see it's very close to what I actually drafted. The difference was in the knob, I had a bit of a flame shape to it as opposed to a round knob because of the curve and coming in, it just a flame just seemed to flow a, a little bit better. If you get something out of this video, please hit the like button. Here's another aspect of, of design. I got this idea from Richard Raff, and sometimes it pays to just knock out some shapes. Uh, we had a, I saw a demonstration a few years ago by one of the club members on a pedestal box, and I thought, well, I, I think I'd like to turn a pedestal box. They, they look nice, and and Richard Raffin had this concept where you just turn the shape. The, these lids do not come off. They're not hollowed out. They're, they're of whatever rough, rough uh, timber I had. Uh, could have been popular. Might have been, might have been pine. It didn't make any difference because I was just knocking out a shape. Uh, spray painting them black, lining them up and looking at it. And I, as I went through the different ones, I, I made a conscious effort to try to change the shape of the base, change the shape of the body, uh, change the shape of the lid, uh, what the lift was and what the knob was, just to get a feel for uh, different styles and different directions I could go.
So one of the factors you want to think about your box design is how large it should be. Richard Raffin suggests uh, three inches is a, is a reasonable size for a box. Larger than that, it gets too hard to hold. Smaller than that, and you need to be very, very precise with, uh, uh, with, with the fittings. Um, some of that may depend on the kind of wood that you've got available. And obviously a pill box is going to be a lot smaller than a, than a Beats, of, Beats of Courage box. Uh, shape, we're going to look at some more boxes, uh, but generally speaking, you want, to cons you want to have curves as much as possible and, and avoid straight lines. There are aspects of some boxes where that might, might be different. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, this one's obviously got a, got a flat uh, top and, and fairly flat sides, although it does taper uh, a little bit. Uh, but most boxes, you, you want continuous curves. The inside of the box, the shape, even on a cylinder box like, like this one, you're not going to have it uh, a 90 degree corner on the bottom with a square scraper because generally speaking it's easier to get contents out of a box and it makes almost no difference what kind of box. Uh, obviously if you get boxes of, of a more rounded shape you're more likely to to obviously start with a rounded bottom, but it may not be obvious to you. So, um, rounded bottoms are generally the way to go. You know, clean up with a scraper, round it off, don't get a square, because it's easier to get contents out of a box. They're more functional when you can roll it up uh, on a rounded surface as opposed to a, a square a square bottom at, at 90 degrees. Now, when it comes to proportion, uh, you know, Frequently you hear the term the rule of thirds uh, or the uh, Fibonacci uh, golden, golden mean uh, and that's what these calipers for. Actually these are used uh, for uh, eyebrows, tattooing eyebrows because apparently there's something to do with the golden ratio in that design for eyebrows that they use this. But these are fairly inexpensive. These are uh, stainless steel I think. But boxes don't have to be uh, in a rule of thirds. Um, a lot of times it might be two-thirds and three-thirds. It, it, it varies. The one thing generally it's not is it's not going to be 50-50. I made this, uh, this box when I was just practicing uh, thread chasing on, on a jig and I, I would just didn't pay any attention to, to proportions but this is just a terrible, you know, aesthetically it's just a terrible uh, size box where the, actually the lid is longer than the than the base. Uh, however, I did turn it into something functional. It had 10 threads per inch, which is fairly coarse, which makes it really practical to use, hard threads. Uh, I filled it up with uh, uh, mineral, mineral oil beeswax concoction that, that I could carry in my toolbox for uh, when I'm demonstrating or doing a workshop uh, that I can use sanding lubricant. So it still winds up being being functional, but it's not aesthetically probably not as practical because, you know, the, the lid is serving no purpose. I could have had a much, much smaller, smaller lid and a larger body carried more, more wax. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about, about lid types. And these are the basic uh, lid types. You've got your in-fit lid or inset. Um, and I'm going to show you some pictures to illustrate this. You've got overfit lid. Uh, typically, even the threaded, uh, uh, most threaded boxes are going to have an overfit lid, even though they might have threads. Uh, a piston fit, which is common on pill boxes and some others. Uh, you might have a, uh, a bellied fit, which Richard Raffin likes, where it starts off with very little friction, uh, friction on the tenon and you it, it slides on gets uh, stiffer and then it kind of snaps on as it comes comes down uh, I don't much care for those the lids then kind of spin on it uh, you've got loose fit lids you got tight fit lids then obviously you got threaded lids so let's look at some some examples here's an example of a, of a threaded uh, box uh, what I'd call, el or what Chris Stott calls an elegant box. He has this design in his, in his book. Uh, very common design. It looks kind of like a lady's uh, cold cream uh, jar. 
This is an inset uh, lid. It also uses contrasting wood. And notice again the box, uh, that little detail shadow line where the, the lid, uh, the, the rim of the box is actually proud of the lid and that, that was intentional by design to kind of give you a little shadow line, a little extra detail. Uh, here's one where the, the lid, I, I, I was practicing texturing after I'd gotten a new texturing tool, and this is a piece of brad from Pear, and as I played with it, worked hard to get this herringbone shape, then after I'd put this much work in, I thought, you know, I need to go ahead and just turn this into a box, so I went ahead and followed through, hollered it out, and for a lid, I decided I would, I would use another scrap of brad from Pear, and make a spin top with some chatter work on it. So the lid is a, actually a spin top. You can actually turn this upside down and the bottom is recessed so you can spin the, the top on the, 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 the bottom of the box. Here's a clamshell uh, box. This, this particular one happens to be a, an inset uh, lid, but let me show you another a, a variation of that. That box that uh, Chris Stott had in his in his book, and that's this clam shape uh, box where in in the 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 bottom actually has a has a tenon and it's an overfit uh, overfit lid, and it's got a not very nice grain match. It's the ambrosia maple. Uh, this looks like a pill box. Uh, actually, it is. It's hard to tell uh, what the scale of this was. Uh, this is a design by Alan Lacer. I got in a magazine article, but it's actually uh, for reading glasses, little cheetah reading glasses. I didn't find it particularly useful, uh, but but that's what it was. That was for, and it was it was fun to turn. Brett, again, uh, if the holes bother you, don't use ambrosia uh, maple with all the beetle, beetle holes in it. Here's two examples of inset lids on the left and the right, on the middle, an overfitting lid. This is a, a uh, inset lid uh, for again for a beads of courage box uh, and let's talk a little bit about uh, most boxes are going to be in grain boxes and that's because they they tend to shrink and expand with seasonal changes and you'll tend to have a a better better fit this one was actually turned cross grain because the bottom is 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 essentially a, a bowl and, and the top is also cross grain. It was actually a cherry uh, board. Uh, here's an inset uh, lid that uh, one I showed very early on that's a ring holder. Here's an inset lid. This is a, just a scrap cherry burl. This one is oh, a little bit smaller than my fist and the top is uh, walnut. Got this out of a fire pile. Uh, here's another example of a pill box with a piston fit. So it's got a long tenon. So when you go to pull the lid off, it, it acts as a suction and it helps keep the lid on there. So if it's rolling around in your in your pocket, and it's got some texturing on on the lid, which not only is to make it a little more attractive, but it's also functional and it makes it a little easier for your fingers to to grip if you had arthritis or something slippery on your hands. And here's here's a lid that I like to make uh, is, is a threaded lid for an acorn box with a, a contrasting contrasting wood. Now let's talk a little bit about knobs and, and notice the knob on this one is an acorn that kind of mimics the bottom of the of the box, just kind of a nice style element that, that ties the top with the entire entire box. Here's some other uh, couple of lids on, on the left, uh, pretty basic type of, of lid. 
The one on the right doesn't have a lid like a lot of our boxes don't, especially cylinder uh, style boxes would not typically have a, 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 I say lid, a, a knob is what I meant to say. Here's an example of, of a little walnut inset lid, but the knob is just a separate contrasting piece of wood uh, that adds a little extra uh, feature by having this little piece of holly. Here's a, a tiny knob that was turned as part of the top, very functional, easy to get your fingers behind it. Again, some more uh, acorn uh, box tops. Uh, two on the left, again, those, those stylized acorns. And, and on the right, uh, a little slightly different design that's got texturing on it. And, the texturing provides an opportunity, the one on the far right, to use some metallic wax to kind of highlight that, that texturing. And again, that uh, winged box. And the, here's the knob on this uh, earlier jewelry box I showed you. Pretty basic knob, but again, one easy to grasp for your fingers to get, get underneath. Uh, here's a, another little winged box with a little simpler design on the, uh, the box lid, a little, little knob. You guys know how much I'd I love to teach or I wouldn't be making these videos. So I, I do teach lessons in my shop. If you live in the Atlanta area, you got relatives in the Atlanta area, or you just, you're just traveling through, uh, check it out. Details on my, my webpage. Let's talk about how we detail the join uh, of the lid and the body of the box. And, and here, these are some of the, but not necessarily the only ways you can detail a join. There's the uh, a slight V groove, and there's what Chris Stott calls a sight line. Uh, that is a thin recess uh, on either the top or the bottom that's about one millimeter deep and a millimeter wide used with a thin, thin parting tool to cut. And uh, a, a nice little detail as I'll show you in a couple of sample boxes here in a moment. Beads, uh, where you put beads on either one side, or either the, block, the base or the top or both. And you're not disguising the joint so much as you are making it easier for wood movement not to be distracting on the box. Uh, then there's burn rings, there, there's, there's a chamfer on the fit where you've got that little detail on the, on the lid that comes down and provides a little shadow line where it meets the, the base. And then a contrasting wood, and frequently you, we use contrasting wood to help um, make up for a bad uh, grain match. We'll talk about grain match shortly. Uh, but but contrasting wood uh, for the lid uh, as as I do on my some on typically on my little pop top boxes that that I'll show in a moment. Contrasting uh, wood. So on the left you'll see that. Uh, slight shadow line around that bead on the top, contrasting wood in the middle, and the sight lines on the two boxes on, on the right. Those little one millimeter uh, cuts, parts. Again, that inset we showed before, a little shadow line. Uh, little V grooves, one on top, one on the bottom, and one right there at the, the joint. The clam, that's a exa good example of the V, uh, the V groove that, that separates the top and the bottom. And it also, it's a functional purpose. It makes it easier for your fingers to grasp if you make a, if, if, if not a tight fit, but a, you know, not a sloppy fit, but it does make it a little easier for, for a one-handed grip to pull that lid off. Okay, let's talk a little bit about grain match. Um, it's nice when we can have the grain match. Your first few boxes you should use a, a fairly straight grain and maybe one that's not too complicated because it, it makes it easier to, to have the grain match. So uh, as you get into more complicated boxes you've got to keep in mind how do you 
keep that grain match and, and the best the easiest way to do that is to make that parting cut as thin as possible but to some extent when you have a tenon that is also going to cause you to lose some of that grain so if you've got grain it doesn't go straight up and down or a pattern or a, uh, a figure that doesn't go straight up and down it's easier to keep that match whereas if it comes in sideways and, and gets larger or smaller it, it does make it a little more difficult to maintain a really uh, good grain match uh, you can see the, the grain, the actual grain pattern in the middle and, and makes it easy to line up. And then of course you can disguise the, the, the issue with grain match by using contrasting wood as the, uh, shown on the one on the right. And here's the easiest way that I use for an acorn box not to worry about grain match is, is to have a different color which you know it makes it look more like an acorn to have two different colors. But that way you don't have to be concerned about grain match. Uh, here's an example of a wood that has very prominent grain. You, most of y'all probably recognize this as ash. And the, the rings were straight because this is quarter sawn uh, wood. And that makes it very easy even though I had the parting cut and I had the tenon, I could still get the grain to, to match uh, very well. Now, the best way to, to cut this is with a... a you know, separate the base from the bottom when you're uh, rough turning it is with a thin parting tool, but you've got to be careful with the thin parting tool you use. I find that the typical thin parting tool like this from Robert Sorby or Penn State is makes it, um, the handle is so short it's hard to do, to part off wood when it starts getting thicker than say, say two inches, in which case you'd need a thin uh, tool that gives you more leverage with a, with a longer handle. So kind of keep that in mind. What some people do is they'll start a thin part and then they'll finish the part on a bandsaw. Personally, I have not had real good luck with that because I, I have, I'm not able to frequently cut it at 90 degrees. It tends to, the blade might wander a little bit. And as a result, when I finish, I wind up having to uh, true up the top and the bottom and I wind up losing more wood than if I just use a thicker parting tool, maybe an eighth, eighth of an inch. And here's that grain match I showed you on that variation of the uh, oyster or clamshell box. Uh, this is a piece of hickory, very prominent grain, uh, but the grain still matches up uh, quite well. I want to talk about inserts. Uh, inserts is an easy way to kind of dress up some of your boxes. Uh, I tell people when they're doing texturing, when they're using a nice nice piece of wood and they get a really nice, and they're playing around with texturing and they get a nice pattern, go ahead and save that little medallion in a disc and use it as a contrasting wood in a, in a box that you want to dress up a little bit, such as this one here. Uh, this one I showed earlier has uh, a little piece of, uh, I think it's Amboynia Burl uh, insert. And here's an insert of some spalted wood. And in addition, around the outside edge, I used uh, powdered uh, brass uh, and left a little recess in there. So when you put it in with, with CA glue and sand it down, it looks like you've got this brass ring around your insert. Just, just another way to dress one up. Here's another piece of, of insert with side grain. The medallion is so thin, it was dried. This was decking wood. Uh, it's a uh, Concalvo uh, Alves, uh, I believe is the name of the, the wood, or, or tiger wood uh, with a very prominent grain. So it was so small, I didn't need to be concerned about the wood movement of that, of that insert. Let's talk a little bit about embellishing, although we've, we've seen some examples of as we go along and, and we're going to repeat on some of the boxes, but the simplest way for embellishing is using a, a, a porography and doing some design. Again, you don't have to be an artist if you use this technique called Zentangle. If you're not familiar with that, just, just uh, JGI, just Google it. Uh, but it's an easy way for doodling. and You can do it, do it with a pen, but you can do it with porography as, as well and just repeat the design. Uh, texturing is, is a way to always kick up a box. You can always do a little textured uh, texturing on the in, inside. As a minimum, I would certainly turn some little, little 
V grooves, uh, but texturing with some metallic wax. And I mentioned how box making is a very sequential process. So you got to make sure when you're doing the inside of a box, before you take that lid off off uh, your chuck, you've got to finish the sanding completely, put finish on it, do any embellishing, and put any metallic wax on it before it ever comes off the lathe, or, or you're going to have real challenges getting it to look good. Uh, here's an example of a different style of embellishing. Uh, this box, this is ash, uh, again, a very prominent grain, and, and a pretty nice grain match. I dyed this black, and then I used uh, what they call liming wax, a, a white wax, to rub into the grain pattern, in, into the grain, to give it a little, little contrast and, and decoration. Here's that box I showed earlier with texturing on the outside of it. Uh, this one again, this is a textured band around the middle between two beads. Beads are always a good way to to em embellish. Uh, whether you do inserts or whether you texture the outside of a box, the inside a metallic wax is a great way to kind of kick it up a, a level. Uh, this is uh, rub and buff. You can get commonly in the U.S. And, and Michaels or Hobby Lobby, but I find there are, are better products. I like Chromacraft, uh, and, and there are other metallic types of, of waxes that do do very well. Well, I hope that was inspirational to you. Sometimes we make things just because it's fun. Uh, when I attended class uh, at, at Aramont, uh, there was a quotation there. It says, the product feeds the ego, but the process feeds the soul. I like that. If you like this video, you might want to check out my playlist of box turning videos. I've got more than 30, 30 videos on various aspects of, of, of box, box turning. Y'all stay safe. Come on back here.